Now, looking at page number seven, we're going to review what I call the maintenance uh, planning process. And uh, here is another indication of the integration of the storeroom with the maintenance work order and planning system. Uh, if you would take a look at the middle uh, row of uh, organizational blocks, if you will, uh, reading across, we start off with planning, and then we schedule, then we look at the maintenance storeroom, and ultimately we will consider a maintenance craft. Now, planning always precedes scheduling. I have a, a constant uh, saying when I talk about planning and scheduling, and it goes something like this. You cannot schedule anything unless you plan it out. If you don't plan it, you're not scheduling, you are launching orders. The planning process, as indicated by the lower left-hand box, references maintenance work orders. Now, those maintenance work orders really originate from the first function within the maintenance management program. Remember uh, the equipment, the spare parts list for that equipment, and all of the maintenance requirements. So that is basically what that lower left-hand box is, is uh, co uh, concluding, maintenance work orders. They could be PM, they could be major, minor overhauls. So the individual in the maintenance planning and scheduling activity will plan those requirements. That plan could go out as far as the uh, planned requirements dictate. If we're considering, as an example, minor overhauls, uh, they could go out six months to a year, and major overhauls can go out one, two, or three years. Now, when we execute the schedule, the schedule should go out approximately one, but no more than two weeks in advance. And the uh, element that supports the scheduling function, as you can see from the uh, scheduling calendar that supports uh, scheduling itself, that scheduling calendar actually has four individual inputs. The first one is the uh, calendar date, which we had re referenced earlier as a fixed uh, date. We also have an input from machine hours. Those are machine hour readings uh, relative uh, to process equipment. We have odometer readings relative to forklift trucks and over the road type vehicles. And then the fourth element would be those readings that are coming into the, uh, or from the predictive maintenance application. Now during the planning process, and you'll see that line that kind of commingles planning, scheduling, the maintenance uh, stores, and uh, the uh, various craft, which is all connected, and then we have that little line that goes up to maintenance management. That line, that the horizontal line, indicates a complete integration of those activities. So the storeroom is bringing to the planning and scheduling uh, process the spare parts, the tooling, and the equipment. Now, the bin on hand in the storeroom is identical as we've indicated previously, the same bin on hand that's in the inventory record. And if a requirement from planning exceeds the bin on hand in the storeroom, then the inventory uh, system uh, kicks into gear and generates either a purchase order requisition to purchasing or generates a manufacturing order for the manufactured part. And the last requirement would be the craft capacity planning. So here is a very simplistic, uh, functional uh, planning uh, process tying together 
the maintenance work order planning system, the storeroom uh, planning system, and likewise craft capacity planning. It's another uh, educational tool uh, to train people in the storeroom relative to the importance that the storeroom plays in the integration within the maintenance management program. Now, the next uh, page uh, addresses the storeroom functions themselves. And like I indicated before, the word function does not mean number of people. Uh, I don't uh, care if you're a small company, a medium, or a large organization. Within your storeroom, you're going to have to address these functions. So this uh, store's functional organization can support several things. First of all, it addresses the specific activity, uh, starting off at the left, receiving and receiving inspection. Then we go into stocking the material, which requires record keeping or bin location. Then we have the order filling or the issuing of material. Uh, we likewise have uh, inventory control addressing the cycle counting portion, which is really accomplished in the storeroom. And that last right hand uh, box indicates material handling, which really indicates the movement of material to the storeroom directly to the job site. Now, the uh, different functions uh, that you can uh, put together in your stores program would be as follows. Number one, depending on your size, how many people must support these five major activities within your storeroom program? Can any of these be combined? As I said earlier, uh, we could uh, combine inventory and purchasing and in a very small company, we could combine inventory, purchasing, and stores, all done by one individual. It, again, it depends upon the size of the craft organization. The second thing that you could do in addition to Manning is establish the procedures right from this organization using many of the data elements on the previous exhibits in this section that we've reviewed. You could also uh, develop, if you will, the inner relationship between these activities, which is the input into what I call an integrated training program. Everyone in the storeroom should be trained to support any uh, one of these specific functions. And that will provide you with what I feel is a good uh, storeroom organization to support the maintenance management program. Now, uh, page number nine addresses some of the reports that you may want to consider uh, to provide to, uh, let's say, maintenance management and other managerial uh, functions within the organization. If you remember, we went through that list of 13 uh, data elements and we talked about maintenance reports I said we will discuss uh, maintenance reports. Well, here is a list of some of the common uh, types of reports that you may want to consider. And again, uh, no list is ever complete. Uh, you may want to add additional uh, activities or functions in your uh, storeroom reporting system. The first one has to do with organization. And that is uh, who does what and what are their individual responsibilities. Uh, that is a report that probably uh, would go to the maintenance supervisor. The second would address spare parts inventory analysis. Now, there's a lot of people in the organization outside of maintenance that would love to have a report on inventory position. Finance, I, I know, would, and maybe a top management would, and sometimes operational uh, management personnel would like to see uh, the trends, if you will, of uh, inventory analysis. So we can develop the inventory analysis by part number. We could do it by commodity or family code. We could do it uh, by 
inventory class code or we can do it by total. Uh, you know, you have options. Uh, the easiest way to support any of these reporting activities is ask the management in the organization what type of reports they want and what is the frequency. Many of these reports uh, would be sufficient on a monthly basis. So the spare parts inventory analysis would include the on hand, the on order, the usage, and trends. And again, if you wanted to add other applications to this, you could talk about a turnover analysis and anything that other people would require. Uh, steps uh, three and four addresses jointly the tooling requirements, and that's the tooling required by maintenance personnel to support a maintenance work order. And again, we have the on hand, we have the usage of the item. Of course, the usage is not the same type of usage that a spare part would have. A spare part is actually consumed uh, into a process based upon the replacement of a spare part uh, for, let's say, its counterpart that we're going to pull out of uh, a particular asset. The usage in tooling and equipment is how many times over a period of a month or whatever that time frame is that we actually use that part. Sometimes these tooling and equipment usages would be an input into our ability to prove to management that we would need additional tooling or equipment to support the activities of tools and equipment against maintenance work orders. We also have, you know, other categories uh, in the storeroom. And uh, those categories could be uh, shipping supply items. They could be safety and health type items that are not an integral part of the spare parts list or any other type of a commodity that uh, you feel uh, should be an integral part of the reporting function. Uh, item number six addresses the store's future plans. And uh, this is really a byproduct of annual usage value analysis, the same annual uh, usage value analysis that we developed in section four for our ABC coding. And it would also uh, indicate the transaction volumes that are uh, identified in item number seven. The transaction volumes uh, would be receipts, uh, let's say bin location putaways, uh, issues, consolidations, and cycle counting. And as the company, let's say, increases in sales volume, and newer assets are being introduced into the operating units. There may be an influx of additional uh, spare parts and those may require the expansion of the storeroom. Uh, and again, this is really an integral uh, part of the inventory management program. If many of the new items can be planned and they really don't have to be housed within the storeroom, but can be carried by a supplier, then the storeroom can actually be contracted as opposed to expanded. So again, uh, these are functions of, of volume and uh, transaction analysis. Now, moving uh, to page number 10, uh, we want to talk about some of the basic data requirements of the storeroom to uh, uh, order, receive, and store material. Now again, as I've mentioned many times previously, we always identify items with the part number, the description, and the unit of measure. Since we're dealing with storage data, we're always going to have some form of quantity associated with the storeroom transactions. So that is going to be paramount uh, relative uh, to the data requirements. Now, when we order, as an example, we may receive into stores 
material from purchase orders. Uh, we may have uh, material being returned from the PM checklist. Uh, we may have uh, maintenance work order returns that are not planned but could be unplanned. We may receive items from the manufacturing ordering system as opposed from the purchase ordering system and we may have other miscellaneous returns. As we explained previously in the previous exhibit, we are going to keep track of transaction volumes. Well, uh, item number five here indicates that we can, if we so desire, and again, this is pick and choose on your behalf, you can keep track of the different types of receipts coming into the storeroom and then they can all be summarized into one transaction called annual receipts. The other key application relative to receiving and storing material is physical identification. And we will be discussing physical identification uh, when we determine the type of storage requirement uh, for each and every part number. Uh, but here we're going to address such things as cubic displacement, which gives us the ability to calculate volume required in the storeroom by part number. Uh, a weight is a key consideration, and that would indicate that certain items are not candidates for a shelf, but are candidates for, let's say, uh, a skid rack for storage because of weight. Uh, we have to address, as we've mentioned many times, the shelf life program, and we'll discuss the shelf life program a little later in this section. And then there may be other considerations from a physical standpoint uh, that you may want to add to this list. Uh, item 7 indicates the storage requirement itself, and that addresses the bin and the number of bins that are required for an item. And again, a little later, we're going to show you how to take the data, which is in item number six, and actually calculate the cubic displacement for the total amount of inventory by part number that may be in the storeroom at any point in time. And that is going to help us to generate not only the layout of the storeroom, but the number of physical storage bins or anything else to actually support the storage activity. And last but not least, uh, we are always reminded of that security issue. Now, turning on to page number 11, uh, we have uh, developed for your use, again, pick and choose, the uh, uh, storeroom item characteristics. Uh, as an example, the first uh, two is the part number, the description. Now, I didn't put unit of measure as three. I'm looking as an example at the commodity code, which again is the family code that would help us to determine where we're going to store the uh, family or the commodity. And then again for each item, item four, we have the unit of measure. Uh, we had on a previous ex uh, exhibit uh, talked about physical characteristics like weight, size, and dimensions. But here we're going into what I call an expanded item characteristic analysis. Uh, we have the total cubic displacement of the maximum quantity stored. And uh, I repeat myself, we'll go through that calculation a little later, it's all in this section. Uh, we address the shelf life uh, requirement. We're also, as we mentioned previously, we may have different storage requirements. Uh, as an example, uh, we may have items that would be stored in humidity, temperature, atmospherically controlled co you know, containers, or any other method of storage like fireproof vaults or outside in the ground storage for flammable materials. We also have the storage bin size, number, and that is an integral part of uh, the various uh, uh, physical characteristics. 
which pertain to item four, five, and six above. We do have a listing for you where we've developed uh, a storage bin size numbering program and we will uh, refer to that a little later in this section. We also have the unit cost which would help us to determine the asset value that we have in the storeroom and that could be done by uh, let's say part number itself or summarized uh, by commodity or family code. We also from our uh, storeroom record would be able to develop usage by different time periods, by day, by week, by month, uh, maybe year to date. And that would be an integral part of, let's say, our transaction volume analysis that we discussed earlier. We have the lead time of the item. It's identical to the lead time that is in the inventory record. And that, again, is the aggregate lead time. And I need that data if I'm going to, let's say, establish some min-max system requirements uh, relative to those items that would support, as an example, a vendor stocking program or a two-bin or bench stock program. Uh, there may be some fixed order quantities, and those are an integral part uh, or a byproduct of the inventory management system. And <clears throat> that data is required by the storeroom to support the type and method of storage and the cubic displacement required. Uh, we have uh, different suppliers uh, that we're receiving material from and the supplier data is furnished to us by purchasing and uh, some of the data would uh, be shelf life codes from certain suppliers. It would indicate what suppliers are an integral part of let's say a vendor performance or appraisal program or what particular uh, suppliers may be uh, currently in what we call a certification uh, analysis area. Uh, the where use code is used by the storeroom to determine the, the degree of uh, urgency or how critical that item is. And if you remember, the where use code is a numeric number. And again, the higher the where use code, the higher the probability that there's going to be an unplanned requirement. So that's going to help us to support the accuracy of not only the quantity on hand, but also the bin location. And again, uh, from item characteristics, there's no listing that ever is complete. So you have the ability to, again, add to this list, tailor it to your specific requirements. Now, the next uh, document uh, is a really a compilation of the last uh, three uh, documents uh, relative to addressing uh, the material uh, storage requirements and so forth. So we're putting this into a, a rather comprehensive list uh, and uh, it is uh, another checklist for you to consider. Some of the items that are on here uh, were not on the previous list, but some are such as the part number and des the description, uh, the unit of measure. Again, we're looking at the quantity stored. Now, we're getting into conversions where we have the package and the quantity in each package. So we could have, let's say, packages within a, uh, a master pack or a master carton, and uh, that would require a conversion. We also would have the number of packages that are stored independently and not necessarily in a uh, master pack and a package would contain more than one item. It could also contain an item and that would be an integral part of the storeroom uh, item master record. Here again we're addressing the size and the weight of the item which is going to help us to uh, <coughs> determine the container that the material will be stored in and also how that uh, material is going to be actually stored within the storage requirements such as uh, a pallet rack, uh, a bin or a shelf or a drawer, a cantilever and any other type of application. And when we get into 
the storage requirements and the storage identification uh, system will be addressing all of the various storage applications at that time. Uh, we also want to determine the number of items or packages per container. There are a few cases where a supplier will send a master pack and in that master pack there may be two or more different part numbers. Uh, here is a case where when we receive one major carton we're going to have to literally uh, get into that carton and do a complete separation of the individual part numbers and then address the quantity received against the packing slip and also the quantity that was actually uh, required on the purchase order. Uh, we have the weight of the container and the content. Uh, again, that's going to help us in storage. The number of containers required, which is similar than the number of packages required, because if you, as an example, would consider a two-bin system, and maybe I get a master carton in with a thousand parts in it, uh, these could be hardware type items used uh, by the repair shops and remember the two bin system supports the repair shops relative to the inventory being placed directly in the repair shop and maybe I package 50 per carton for the repair shop to support the two bin system. So if I have a receipt of a thousand and I'm going to package 50 per uh, carton, then I go through a conversion and indicate that I actually need uh, 20 individual cartons to support the two bin system. Uh, there's also a need to consider for a floor space uh, for items that are not conducive to be placed in a bin. Uh, as an example, maintenance equipment such as wheelbarrows, uh, step ladders, scaffolds, uh, cherry pickers, high boys, uh, and anything else uh, that is, uh, you know, basically housed on what I call uh, the floor level. That's going to take up cubic displacement, and that's going to be an integral part of the requirement for stores layout. There are also some restrictions uh, that you want to consider relative to stacking limits. Uh, there are items that come in bulk, like some of the, uh, let's say, media for cleaning or air conditioning and heating media or media that is used for filtration requirements in, uh, let's say, the various uh, processing equipments. And the, these media uh, containers may be rather large and bulky. They may not be heavy in weight. And we certainly don't want to start stacking these up uh, where ultimately we could have an unsafe condition in the storeroom. So stacking limits is a responsibility of the supervision of stores to determine how safe we can stack without causing injury to anyone in the storeroom. Uh, space required uh, for the warehouse when we get into layout We'll look at not only the storage requirements, but the various aisles that are required, the receiving area, uh, the staging area for material to be released against the planned uh, maintenance work orders, and then the shipping area. Uh, there's also a need, again, for transaction analysis, and that is what we call frequency of demand or issue. And the, the next item is the issue or lot size quantity. Uh, in many cases, we can pre-package based upon uh, a particular repetitive order. One illustration would be, let's say, a tune-up kit for uh, an over-the-road vehicle uh, where I may have, let's say, a six-cylinder uh, engine and the tune-up kit would have the condenser, the six spark plugs, uh, any gaskets that are required, they all can be pre-packaged and I would recognize uh, that type of requirement through the maintenance work order planning process. And the storeroom 
as we saw earlier, is integrated within the planning process. So here again, we could help ourselves to prepackage items uh, ready to be issued out against the uh, scheduled uh, planned maintenance work order. Other applications like hazardous, uh, you know, nature uh, would require the support of any OSHA, FDA, or other uh, local, uh, you know, uh, storage requirements, or also uh, from your own insurance carrier. And again, where we have unique storage requirements for hazardous type items, those should be reflected on the item master record in the storeroom so that no one, uh, you know, has a po possibility of not identifying the way those hazardous items are not only stored, but also how they are uh, issued against uh, maintenance orders. Other things like susceptibility to deterioration may have to do with atmospheric conditions or, as an example, through evaporation. So here again, we have to address the type of storage requirement, the type of container we want to house the material in to eliminate deterioration or uh, evaporation or other byproducts that would reduce the volume, if you will, of those materials we're carrying on hand. Uh, and uh, anything that you can think of, I put into this miscellaneous category. Again, please expand this list to cover other applications that are unique to your storeroom program. Now, the uh, uh, next series of documents are going to address what I call a very comprehensive item master record, and we're going to try and pull together much of the data that we have reviewed relative to how to store it, the method of storage, the various transaction analyses, and so forth. So we've discussed up to this point some of the key storeroom storage considerations. Now what we want to do is to put those into a item master record, which then will support the storeroom program. So as uh, we've uh, indicated on page uh, 13A, we have item master record data, and the first subheading is called general information. Now, general information uh, can be utilized not only by stores personnel, but can be utilized by the inventory and the purchasing system. So that as we build our database for item master record, and this is especially true when you are in a CMMS environment. You don't want to have individual records for the different activities in maintenance management. You want to consider one. So this is the approach that we've taken here. So let's address some of the general information that people would use in the storeroom and outside of the storeroom. We start off with our part number, followed by a description, then we have a unit of measure. Now the unit of measure for purchasing is the purchase unit of measure. The unit of measure for manufacturing would be the unit of measure that would be on a manufacturing order for a spare part. The unit of measure for stores and warehousing would be the same unit of measure that would be in the inventory system and also the spare parts equipment list. And there may be a conversion required between 3A and 3C. And then we also have the unit of issue. And that could be slightly different than the unit of storage. But this gives us an indication that we can integrate all of these different unit of measures depending upon the individual functional requirement. Functional requirement meaning stores, inventory, and purchasing. Now we have, uh, as item four indicates, the cost of the item. The majority of companies are 
uh, either in or moving toward a standard cost system. And that is we maintain the cost of the item for one year unless there is a major either a material or labor cost change either internally by your own manufacturing application or by a supplier and then that cost may be changed. We try and re retain the standard cost for at least one year and then we would have an update on the standard cost system. About 80% of the companies that I have been associated with are using the standard cost system. About 19%, and these are just rough estimates, uh, are using the average cost system. And they're averaging the previous cost to the current cost, and then that continues on on an average basis. The balance of that 1% uses other costs like the actual or the estimated, or FIFO, first in, first out, or LIFO, last in, first out. Those cost systems are generally defined by the financial department. Item number five indicates how do we obtain the item. Is it a make or is it a buy? Uh, do we manufacture it or do we purchase the item? And that would be recorded uh, not only in the inventory record, but also the purchasing record, and likewise in the storeroom record in terms of the ability to receive material properly either against a manufacturing order or a purchase order. Now moving on to page 13b, we have inventory information. And again remember, this is one expanded item master record. Item 6 addresses the inventory classification code and in this case an, an emergency item is class 01. A spare parts list item is uh, class code 02 and the standard item and all other items will be classified as 03 all the way through 18. We have the wear use code which is the numeric wear use number. Uh, we have the lead time and you'll notice the purchased lead time is not what is in the purchasing system but that is for purchased items. That's the aggregate lead time. The manufactured lead time is the lead time for manufactured items that we manufacture internally. Uh, we have item 9, the inventory control technique code, which uh, really is a byproduct of our inventory ordering matrix uh, that was identified in, in section number 4 as was the inventory class codes and likewise the development of the wear use code was defined in section number two of the notebook. The uh, date that the inventory control technique code was established is identified in item 10 and item 11 indicates who established the uh, individual inventory control technique code on the assumption that you have two or more personnel responsible for the inventory management system. Now continuing on, on page 13C, we're addressing some of the other data that's in the inventory record, but also used by the storeroom. We have our ABC code, and that again is the input into cycle counting. So 13 is the cycle count frequency code, that actually is the date code in the shop calendar. Uh, we also have the purchase order cost, which is item 14. The manufacturing setup cost, if the item is purchased, uh, which is item 15. We have the inventory carrying cost, which is uh, really to be supplied to us by finance, and that's identified as 16. And the last, uh, inventory uh, data would be the shelf life code. And here again, inventory management, purchasing management, and the stores program are all utilizing the shelf life code. Now to get into more of the specific storage data, uh, we have as an example uh, storage information. And uh, Item number 18 addresses the maximum quantity stored. 
and there is a formula for the maximum quantity stored. Uh, it is equal to one half the previous order quantity plus the current order quantity. In other words, average inventory, if you remember we discussed that in section number four, is equal to half of the previous lot size. We assume that if the supplier ships on hand or we manufacture uh, the material uh, where we bring it in according to the due date, it is conceivable that the maximum quantity stored is the sum thereof of average inventory uh, plus the current lot size. So again, let me repeat that. The maximum quantity stored is equal to one half the previous order quantity plus the current order quantity. And we can therefore uh, convert that into cubic displacement as we'll show you how to do that a little later. And I mentioned that before in previous exhibits. And therefore we can determine item 19, the storage bin size code. And the storage bin size code is for various different types of storage entities. And likewise, we have that listed for you as I mentioned previously. We can therefore, as a byproduct of the calculation of 18 and where and how we're going to store material 19, we could determine the number of storage bins required. Now, you may ask a question at this point. Frank, I'm a small company. Do I have to go through this analysis? No. I'm a medium-sized company. Do I have to go through this for all my part numbers? The answer would be no, but maybe some should. And then I'm a very large company. Uh, should I go through this calculation? And my answer would be, please consider it. Because I have worked with companies that have three, 4,000 SKUs, stock keeping units in the storeroom but I've worked with others that have from 200 to 300,000 part numbers in the storeroom. So we can utilize the data in 18, 19, and 20, and using a little PC program, we can actually automate the calculation, and it'll be very apparent how to do that once we go through the exhibits in this section that addresses storage requirements. So again, like I said before, we pick and choose from the data we're talking about. Very large organizations, I would say please consider it because it's going to help you uh, to have a much improved layout. Remember, once bins and other storage facilities are in place, it's uh, very expensive to start rearranging the warehouse. When we get into the special environmental issues, those are identified on, uh, as item number 21. Now, the items that we're identifying are a byproduct of what uh, may be a storage issue for these items. As an example, flammability, combustibility, evaporation, explosiveness, deterioration, the fragility of the item, whether it's toxic or not, and others. These are the items that we want to code, and the coding should indicate the method of storage, the handling procedure, and also the dispersing procedure. These would require a specific procedures and techniques relative to the activities for these particular items. Now continuing on, uh, in page 13E, we have additional storage data elements like the physic physical characteristics that we talked about several times previously, the size, the dimensions, the weight, the bulkiness, and any other application. And then item three, or 23 is addressing our pilferage code, and if you remember, those are items uh, that may have a high resale value on the street. And again, my recommendation, as previously, uh, is to put those items in what we call a bonded crib within the warehouse. Now, 
page uh, 13F is going to address uh, the activity information and I also referred to this previously uh, as transaction volume data. Uh, in a larger and maybe a medium-sized company, uh, you could develop the type of software application where it will track uh, some of these activities. Now, the inventory system and the storage record will track annual usages. The number of annual disbursements is basically tracked in the storeroom. We also want to track, as uh, indicated by item number 26, the annual receipts. And likewise in 27, we're talking about cycle counting and cycle count errors. And 28 is identifying uh, the uh, number of adjustments as a byproduct of not only the cycle count program, but the annual inventory program. These are all activity uh, data, and they can support how and where a material should be stored. When we get into the layout portion, as I said previously, we will show you how to use this activity data to support the layout. Now, moving into uh, the layout itself, uh, starting off on page uh, 14, uh, we want to talk about some of the basic requirements of stores control. And here again, you should develop the procedures and the systems to support each one of these particular requirements. The first question is what goes where? That really starts the development of the layout. And when we get into the layout detail, which is very comprehensive, we're going to address all of those issues uh, with you. But here again, you're going to have to pick and choose those data elements relative to what are going to impact your own storeroom. You have to establish the organization. We've, we've already developed that. But you see here, the organization is going to support uh, the layout of the storeroom. In other words, if I had a receiving and a shipping area combined, then the activities of receiving and shipping uh, can be combined in one physical area. But in another case, I may have receiving at one end of a storeroom and shipping at the other end. So the procedures uh, relative to the organizational requirement are going to be a little different. I may have to have two people, and again, depending on size of the organization, uh, one to support the receiving function and the other to re uh, support the shipping activity. We have to develop the disciplines within the organization, and the disciplines are very simple to define. The first discipline is security, and the second discipline is identification of material and the third discipline is the discipline of transaction control. The uh, fourth element uh, addresses the equipment issue uh, which we've discussed previously but we do have an exhibit in this section that addresses some of the different equipments that you may want to consider to support the maintenance storeroom. The location control uh, program, uh, there are basically two types. There's one which we address as straight numeric, and the other one uh, is uh, odd and even. Both of these are identified in uh, this section of the notebook, and we actually have uh, a small layout. When I say small, it's on uh, an 8.5 by 11 document in, in the notebook which identifies both types of uh, location control systems. And then last but not least, we've talked about transaction control. And remember, there's five transaction in the storeroom. Uh, receiving, uh, bin location, issue, consolidation, and cycle counting. And again, these six elements really addresses 
the activities relative to stores layout and uh, stores data integrity. So moving forward, I would recommend that if you want to consider the relayout or maybe the movement from the current location to a new location uh, in your storeroom program, then do something similar what I did on page number 15. I've identified some of the major storeroom problems uh, as a byproduct of working with companies like yourself. Uh, my uh, comment is if you're going to lay out or if you're going to relocate the storeroom, don't transfer the cancer with you. Uh, <clears throat> the other objective of this particular page is there should be no store problems. This page should be blank. And that's the objective of this particular document. And let's take a look at some of the data elements here. Misplacement. Misplacement said, I went through the receiving function, identified, I counted, I went through receiving inspection, but I didn't put it in the proper bin location or I put it in a bin location, but when I went back to the uh, record for location control, I put the wrong location number on the record. We've got a procedure uh, for this, and we're going to define that procedure for you a little later. Wrong identification is because we're not following the disciplines of identification for all items, and that is part number, description, and unit of measure. The description in many, many cases uh, and looking at the physical uh, element of the part number would indicate that we have a wrong part. In some cases, identification tags could have been switched. Uh, and therefore, I've got two misidentified items. Again, you want to consider the three data elements that I've been talking about continuously. Part number, description, and unit of measure. Now, damage is just carelessness within the storeroom. But that could have been precipitated by not having the proper material handling equipment or maybe the proper storage equipment. Pilferage, we've you know, addressed that. Uh, the bonded crib within the storeroom uh, is a key way to eliminate pilferage. Spoilage is a byproduct of storing material uh, in, as an example, uh, the wrong environment, or it could likewise uh, be the lack of a shelf life program. And deterioration, which we addressed before, again, is having the wrong type of storage item that the material is being housed in. Now, these are some of the most common items that uh, we have uh, had an opportunity uh, to address with many of our clients. You may have others. List them down here. Don't lie to yourself. Put them down and then address the question, what do I need to do to eliminate the items on page number uh, 15? Now, moving on to the storeroom layout itself we have what we call storeroom layout considerations. These are like, uh, I don't want to be uh, philosophical, but they're like the commandments of layout. They are the entry into the layout program. Uh, they go uh, very easy and they're understandable. Uh, item one addresses the entry into the storeroom. How is material going to be received into the storeroom? Remember earlier, and I've said this several times, we're having a self-contained storeroom. We receive directly into the storeroom. That means uh, the carrier from the supplier to me is going to drop that material off directly into my storeroom. Now, in some cases, because of physical constraints, that may not be practical. Therefore, material may be received 
by what we call a central receiving dock. If that's the case, then that material should only be addressed relative to the bill of lading and the number of cartons that are uh, pertain to that bill. That material should be put on some type of a dolly or a forklift truck or whatever and moved into the maintenance storeroom. That is the point that we want to truly receive against the supplier packing slip and go through the receiving activities. Uh, we want to talk about the ease of receiving material. How is material going to be uh, placed? Where is it going to be placed on? How is it going to be located? And how long will it be in that receiving area? So that's going to kind of lead us into the cubic displacement and the square footage required for the receiving function. When we get into the storage, we want to address those storage requirements that we've gone through previously, and that is how easy is it to put material into storage? Well, if I'm going to take, a, let's say, a motor, and for safety purposes, I want to band the motor to, let's say, a skid, it's properly identified, I may need a forklift truck or a high boy to be able to move that material to the proper uh, bin rack and then ultimately store the uh, motor uh, properly. So again, we have to look at not only uh, the items by individual part number, but items within a commodity and then determine the uh, method in which we're going to actually store material. The ease of working in the storeroom is basically threefold. How do I put material away without uh, hindering people that may be order filling and those that may be doing the consolidation, the housekeeping as an integral part of, let's say, cycle counting. So we want to consider uh, the ease of working in the storeroom, which leads us into maybe aisle widths uh, and the number of aisles uh, required in the layout. Uh, the safe working condition, again, pertains to the safety and health analysis of the storeroom. Uh, as cycle counting is a key requirement, which is identified in item number six. And uh, we've previously talked about, you know, cutoff procedures of cycle counting uh, in uh, section number four. We'll look again at cycle counting in this section, but cycle counting can be done during the same uh, time that we are putting items away and we're filling orders. And that really goes back to item number four, the ease of working in the storeroom. Uh, the ease of issuing material. We are going to house planned maintenance work orders in a planned maintenance work order staging area. Uh, I'm going to have to release that material when it's gone from plan to schedule to release and issue it uh, to specific craft personnel. What is the procedure to accomplish that? I may also deliver the material to the job site. So that is a key consideration in item number seven. And item number eight is the delivery issue. But I may have uh, a delivery issue not only to the job site, but also, if I have a central shipping dock for material to go back to a supplier or out for repair, or delivering material to a decentralized storeroom uh, in various locations throughout uh, the facility. So here again, these are uh, eight steps that we want you to consider uh, relative to defining not only the layout, but how we're going to work in the environment once the layout has been completed.